Um, great panel of people. We're going to get started right away here because we're already running a bit behind schedule. So I just invite everyone to join me on stage here. Okay, great. So first to my left is uh, Nick Carey, co-founder and CEO of blockchain.info, the world's largest mobile uh, Bitcoin wallet and uh, leading voice in the space and someone we interviewed for the book and provided some uh, really valuable insights. Dave Gorman works in the IBM Blockchain Lab enablement team. He's worked in the IT industry for over 26 years and worked closely with customers across a variety of industries. Delighted to have him here. Uh, we've got Michael Dillian, uh, who is the founder of Geneva-based Health Bank, the only citizen-owned health data exchange cooperative, and also co-founder of Ubase, which is using this technology to solve issues in the healthcare industry. And finally, Paul Pacifico, CEO of the UK's Featured Artist Coalition, which represents the interests and rights of artists in the music industry, which, as we know now, is a big opportunity. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then we're going to open it up to the floor to uh, let everybody participate here. So let's start with you, Nick. What is it about blockchain that excites you the most? <laughs> uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so I've been in this industry for four years, which makes me a dinosaur, which is kind of funny. Um, it's really exciting to watch so much of the work that has been put in over the last four years so succinctly uh, articulated in this book. So thank you guys for all the work you guys put into that. I think the demystification has been a major problem in our industry. When I started off, I was told that it would be career suicide, and uh, that has proven not to be the case, but primarily through the incredible efforts of some really smart people. So um, my firm is called Blockchain. We run blockchain.info and own blockchain.com. So uh, we frequently get confused with the core innovation of this whole project, um, which is really good for our SEO and super confusing to the community. But we focus on doing um, a couple things. Our mission is to build an open and fair and accessible financial future, one piece of software at a time. So we build wallets to make it simple for people to send, receive, and store digital value. So you can visit blockchain.com and download one right now. It's free, it's open source. With 10,000 lines of computer code, you can replace your need for a bank. So if you can let that settle in for just a second, with 10,000 lines of free computer code, you can basically start to transact and perform economic interactions with anybody else in the world that has one of these basically for free. So we add about 100,000 new users a week, which seems to surprise people. We're one of the fastest growing technologies, uh, technology companies in the world right now. We also do a couple other things. We run blockchain.info, which is a data and analytics property. It allows people to study and search the Bitcoin blockchain. And we run blockchain.info's APIs, which are for developers and enterprises around the planet that want to build things on top of the blockchain. So um, when I'm asked what makes me excited about this, it's really hard to kind of pinpoint one thing. Um, for me, I've only ever worked in technology companies. And I see this as a historic opportunity to essentially build a a fair and open system that all of us get to participate in. And so we're all living on a planet now that has systems and structures that were kind of put in place before we got here. And I'm really excited about building and creating things um, that are new and that allow for us to broadly bring more participants into things. And so for me, when people ask me what is the, the scope of this, I mean, we can bring every person on the planet into the economic sphere of influence of the internet. And if we can do that, we can unlock incredible amounts of human capital, incredible amounts of real capital. And I think that's a benefit to everybody. So I expect that that will lead to a more peaceful and prosperous planet. And that's why uh, I don't sleep and I work on this pretty much around the clock. Great. David. Hi. Uh, th thank you for inviting us, uh, Alex. And, um, I think, so, you know, th there's a really vibrant community out there that's working on um, blockchain technologies. And, and that's really exciting to see. So. IBM's part of a Hyperledger project, which is an open source uh, project run by Linux Foundation. And the community and the, the industries and the, and the partners that are part of that is, is, is a very exciting uh, project to be part of. Um, in terms of customers, so we, we're talking to a lot of uh, sort of traditional customers, um, be, being IBM. And what we find is that there's such an appetite for, for understanding blockchain, for uh, understanding it and then moving into uh, sort of a proof of concepts and, and really trying to uh, work out how to innovate within their existing businesses uh, using the technology. Um, and, you know, th I think what, the, what we're seeing is that, that um, businesses are really seeing it as like a sort of a, a springboard um, for looking at existing uh, business networks that perhaps have been in place for decades, if not hundreds of years, 
Uh, I mean, letter of credit is a really good example, which has been around, the process has been around for many hundreds of years. And, and lots of uh, banks and uh, central banks, etc., are looking at the blockchain and looking at how they can use that to completely re re reinvent those existing uh, uh, business networks that they've, they've had in place for, for a long time. Great. Michael? I would uh, reiterate, thank you very much, Alex, for in inviting me to the, the panel. Uh, this is unusual for me because usually I'm uh, on a panel t discussing uh, uh, healthcare. Everybody understands the problem with healthcare. Nobody has a clue about blockchain. So I sound like an expert when I begin talking about blockchain. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many people in the audience uh, come from healthcare or are involved in healthcare, but let me just kind of sum up where I think the potential for blockchain or a distributed ledger or, or a, a peerless data network. Um, all these little sound bites that go along with this technology. Imagine if you or someone you love that might have a medical condition could instantaneously tell their clinician how they were doing in relation to everybody else in the world that had that exact same medical condition. Now, what's interesting about that statement is it sounds pretty simple, right? I love your, you know, the, the digital wallpaper, because it happens, I'm a reformed serial tech entrepreneur, and it's very easy for me to tell how I'm doing in a massive online multiplayer game or um, you know, any of these other facets of my life in, in relation to other people. I wanna know how I'm doing in, you know, in, in what I talk about. LinkedIn has a chart for that. But I, if I have a, a, um, a medical condition, or even better, if I wanna know I recently turned 50 years old, Okay, no gasp, I know, right? Um, but I'd like to know, am I, am I doing okay? Am I doing the right things? There's a lot of different pieces of media and information coming in, and we've got a lot of research on the other side, and there's really no way to tell how that looks. So I, the big promise behind blockchain and life sciences and healthcare, from a technology standpoint, that is the hurdle and moving forward with better healthcare to lower cost. By the year 2050, I'm, I live uh, in, uh, in, in Central Europe. I've lived there for 15 years. By the year 2050, one in every two people will be over the age of 65. That big hurdle is how are we going to create those contextualized viewpoints for clinicians and other care providers? And how are we gonna do it in a secure way? And how are we gonna do it in a way that enhances the value to the individual? And I've looked at this lots of different ways. That's how I started Health Bank. But truly, blockchain offers the promise and the potential to allow this ubiquitous transfer of data between us all. And you know, the next time we hear a news headline like, you know, uh, oh, by the way, guys, forgot to tell you, this is the NHS talking. Um, we have a data sharing agreement with Google, which, by the way, doesn't make the NHS evil or anything along those lines. It, it, it adds to the bottom line for the healthcare in this country. But uh, I'd sure like to be, no, I'd like to be involved in that value chain. Mm -hmm. If we're selling 1.6 million uh, patient records to Google, hey, um, uh, I wouldn't mind um, getting a discount on uh, you know, some medicine or, or, or healthcare or whatever it may be, and you need these sorts of, this sort of system, this sort of technology to take advantage of that. And that's what Ubase, which I co-founded uh, along with um, a few other really uh, much more uh, brilliant folks in the healthcare space, um, that's the, that's the view of, of, of you base is to be able to create a platform where healthcare and life sciences can do, can put together nodes based on blockchain to exchange this information. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Alex. Um, I think we heard Imogen speak earlier uh, and, and speak to how passionate many artists have become about blockchain. And I think for the music industry, there, there are a huge number of applications. I'll keep it very brief. I just want to talk about two things very quickly. Mm -hmm. The first is that in the music industry, traditionally, we sign very long, long contracts. They're for life of copyright, which on master recordings uh, currently sits at 70 years. But with the pace of change, most of those contracts are out of date before the ink is dry. So technology's moved on, delivery systems, formats, everything else. Um, and those contracts can't keep pace. So the idea of having contracts that are kind of living, breathing things in software that can adapt is an extremely exciting proposition. The other problem that we have is this kind of extraordinary flowering 
of creativity and contact. Um, we've seen huge innovation in the music's transition to the, to the sort of digital marketplace, but all of it really has hit one side of the value chain only, and that's between creator and consumer, between artist and fan. So we can make music, we can have it around the world instantaneously. People from all over the world can listen to our music in seconds. We can all sing a song together here, record it on a phone, it'll be on YouTube before we leave the room, and multiple other platforms. Um, but that disintermediation and reintermediation has only really happened on that side of the value chain. The other half of the value chain, from consumer back to creator, has not really seen anything like that kind of uh, improvement. Um, and we see statistics around, you know, it can, it can take up to six years for money to filter back down. So seconds to get a song out there and six years to get value back. And the transaction costs of getting that money back are extraordinary. So the idea of disintermediating, having uh, instant reconciliation, an almost, in, uh, an almost complete loss of counterparty risk. You haven't got people sitting on your cash for years at a time, and they may or may not be reliable. They may or may not be auditable. You may or may not even have the right to audit them. Um, it's an astonishing proposition, and I think brings a sense of balance. And blockchain for the music industry is an analogy for us, really, to illustrate all of the problems that have been around for decades. And for the first time, there's a kind of solution out there that suggests what you might draw up today if you were to reinvent the music industry in 2016. Okay, those were all amazing answers. So I'm actually going to change my second question, um, which is specific to your industry, to each of the things you just talked about. Um, what is the thing that um, worries you the most that might prevent that specific application. So Michael, what would prevent a open, secure um, system for the free movement of data and the you know, enablement of personal control, the system that you're building with, with UBase? What's gonna stop that? Sure. It's the story of David and Goliath, except it's a, uh, blockchain is, is uh, there, there's, a, there's an identity crisis. Blockchain is the Goliath. No pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I, that, you know, I, I do a routine also. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, but you know, that's, that's really it. It's, it's this idea around the, the cost of um, the transfer cost. And certainly um, in, in certain areas of the world, there's, there's regulatory bodies that need to be educated on what this means for you know, the ecosystem players, so insurers, payers, pharma, um, providers, things along those lines. So my big, the, the, the big hurdle is, um, and it's getting solved, but it's, it's, it's around the, um, the incumbents. Okay, David. I think the regulators, are, you know, is a good example. But I, I, you know, I've spoken to regulators and governments, and in both cases, they're actually really, really interested in the technology. Um, it, you know, the, the, the potential for the insight that, that they get as a regulator onto the blockchain information is, is very appetizing to them. And so, you know, there's, there, there is a real appetite in government and uh, regulators to, to see the technology um, be used and to, to, you know, the innovation to, to happen there. Um, I think one area might be um, around data protection regulation. And so, you know, with, with the inherent sort of distributed um, aspect of the blockchain, um, I think one area that probably will, will come under some scrutiny is, is around the sharing of that data across the peer-to-peer the -peer network. And, you know, and I suppose that perhaps comes back to regulation again, but it will be an area that will, you know, if, if you've got a very large distributed network, um, and that has private, data, you know, personal data in which we would expect it to have, you know, some of that. Then, you know, how, do, how does that correspond to, to data protection regulations? And, uh, you know, so I think that could be a challenge, but, you know, certainly not something that can't, can't be overcome. Okay, so we've heard uh, incumbents, uh, regulators, maybe questions about the technology. Nick? Um, there's actually a website dedicated to this. It's called Bitcoin and Blockchain Obituaries.com. And like <laughs> the mainstream media has declared the project an incredible failure, something like 108 times. And of course, the network continues to run without interruption 365 days a year, 
And so I wish all of the projects I got involved with were as big of a colossal failure as something that's created $10 billion worth of wealth in just a few years. Um, so I have a pretty optimistic viewpoint. I think the biggest challenges are probably, um, there, there are huge technical challenges here. The system sounds really uh, spectacular, but it's very difficult to make these things run at scale. And so the most challenging thing we're working on right now is not figuring out how to digitally secure a few dozen transactions a second, which is actually the volume that the Bitcoin blockchain can manage, but actually trying to sort out how to do hundreds of thousands of transactions a second. And uh, we're making some important progress on that. Um, just a few weeks ago, blockchain announced the release of the, something called the Thunder Network. It's a peer-to-peer uh, -peer settlement and clearing technology that lives on top of the blockchain and settles back to it, but it uses these trusted nodes. And in our initial testing, we ran a production level test on this. Um, we got uh, levels around 100,000 transactions a second, which should be pretty exciting to people that know anything about payments, because that's four times more than the Visa network, running at near zero cost. So we're making large leaps. Things are happening quickly. Um, but there's, uh, I think that like, the, the big risks are primarily companies coming in that don't really know what they're doing and uh, not taking the time to be steady. This is financial services. It involves value transfer. It's just not a cowboy show anymore. So avoiding self-inflicted gunshot wounds to the head is probably advisable. Um, I think there are 65 million people in this country <laughs> that should have taken that advice. So yeah, and like you know, <laughs> no comment on that. Uh, you know, we've had a great home here. I think the UK does have some special advantages in financial services. Um, one of our my friends here was talking about it earlier tonight. You've got proximity between the government, the regulators, and a whole bunch of human capital that's been working in financial services for a long time. And so there's something special there. Um, and I think you know being able to access European markets still very very important. So we're hopeful to see some sanity um, over the next couple of years here. There was something really special happening in London, an entrepreneurial scene that didn't exist four or five years ago had kind of come up, and uh, we need to see scaling, we need to see some people and founders return some of the value they're creating and put it back into the ecosystem here. That's what happened in you know, San Francisco 35 years ago. We were very, very close. It's a precious moment and things are fragile. Um, you know, we're here, we're hiring like crazy still, um, and we need to see some cool minds get through this political change um, and, and paint a better portrait of the future. And so that is a huge challenge. Uh, I'm not a political person, and I urge people to, to find those people and encourage them to participate, because we need them. Great. Paul, and then we're going to open it up. Great. I think the biggest challenge for the music industry has got to be adoption. And I think in two respects. One is obviously consumer adoption, but the other is incumbent adoption. Uh, you talked earlier about, you know, uh, used a rather more polite turn of phrase than I would have about bad data in and bad data out. Uh, but we, we persist in an industry where a lot of large corporations are built on bad data, they're built on inefficiency, they're built on, on rubbish. Why do you want a database that tells everybody when a track falls out of copyright when that means you'll stop earning money? <laughs> I mean, last week it was reported in the press that finally, finally, and we're not talking about small songs, we're not talking about obscure stuff that's under the carpet, it's finally been proved in court that one of the major publishing companies does not own Happy Birthday. Now, you've got to ask yourself, why is the song Happy Birthday not in any Hollywood movies? Because they would have to go to this publishing company and say, please, please can we sing Happy Birthday? Well, <laughs> so this publishing company have got to pay back $14 million worth of licenses just for something like the last three years' uses of Happy Birthday, right? And a court's finally gone, oh, yeah. Some wacky researcher making a documentary kind of made it their mission in life to prove that the song wasn't owned by the publishing company that thought owned it or claimed ownership. So there's a lot of this stuff going on. So we've got people thriving on disproportionate transaction costs, people thriving on bad data, and we've got a, a fundamentally inefficient market. And when, when there was an effort to resolve some of these issues, there was a thing called the Global Repertoire, Repertoire Database. It was the music industry's own NHS IT fiasco. You know, multi-millions of pounds, years of time. And the whole thing fell apart. Because not, not because the technology couldn't work, although I don't know if centralized databases really are the way to go. It's another conversation. It wasn't because the tech couldn't work. It's because ultimately people didn't want to share. They didn't want to share because they didn't want everyone to know what was really going on. So there are some real issues here. And, and I feel that, that the exciting challenge is to resolve how you can use technology like blockchain and the sort of solutions that blockchain suggests to shine a light on, on, on 
parts of industries where there is opacity, there is inefficiency. And I think, yes, you know, there are challenges around job losses, and I think you've highlighted some of those on your, your eight, eight challenges on your slide. Um, but really, are we in the business of constructing an efficient market in a meritocracy where entrepreneurs actually see the, the value, a share, fair share of the value they generate? Or are we in the market of job creation because we're worried about a future in which people are socially unfulfilled? That's an important question. Fascinating. Okay, let's open it up to the floor. Um, questions, go ahead. Hi, I have a question. Thank you guys for your time. It's been very informative. Um, blockchain sounds very exciting. Oh. Hi, Renee. Um, blockchain sounds very exciting, but if you don't have a technology background and, and with the automation and smart contracts, what does that mean for jobs in the future? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. I can answer that quickly. Yeah, go for it. Um, so a few years ago, the only people working in this industry were people that had either backgrounds in computer science or distributed computing or cryptography, very intimidating fields for most people to come into. Um, frankly, we needed people that do not have any of those skills to come and explain this stuff to everybody else. Um, people that are writers and branding experts, people that have expertise in sales and customer service. And so there are lots of new opportunities that weren't there three or four years ago that are coming online. Um, I think a lot of those are around defining product market fit. So if you have experience doing that, I think you can probably help companies in this industry. Um, but the you see the scope is so massive, whether you're into music or healthcare or looking at it from an enterprise scale. Like, I guarantee you that everybody in this room can provide value to some company that's working in this industry right now. And that's pretty cool. I think if you're going to spend your time investing your career in building on things, there have been a few technical waves that we all maybe like caught a line on or missed. One of those was the dot-com boost. And that helped a few companies become quite special, companies like eBay and Amazon and a few others. Then you have the social media companies like Twitter, Facebook, and the others. There is totally a tidal wave right now going after financial services. This is a big deal. There's a lot of smart people working in this space. So I think it's wise to pay attention to it. Michael, you wanted to add something? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to sort of backstep that on, on the healthcare and life sciences piece. If anybody in the room is working for uh, or managing healthcare and life sciences company or entity, we are talking to some of the world's largest uh, pharmaceutical companies, some of the world's largest uh, data aggregators, and some of the world's largest insurers. Um, within these multi-billion dollar entities, one or two people understand what this is. They're ambassadors. Um, I, of course, couldn't name any names, but one gentleman in particular um, uh, is, is rising through the ranks at a company. Uh, a very large company because he's the only one that understands how to explain it at the executive corporate strategy level. So yeah, it's, 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 yeah. a, it's a career builder if you understand how product market fit, it, it, it could work the potential of it within whatever your domain is. I'll, I'll add one thing to that, which is the best way to understand this technology is to read the book. <laughs> and then, oh, sorry. And then, exactly. And First then, step. And then go out and buy the book in massive volume for friends, families, you know. Christmas joke. is not too far away. No, I was going to say, jo joke, joking aside, uh, joking aside, I think there's That was not a joke, but all right. No, there's, no, but there's a... <laughs> There's an, important, there's an important second wave here, which is, you know, there, there has been that first rush of kind of, you know, building the straw man stuff and the technology and the test cases and all these, you know, pilot projects and everything else. And we're now seeing, I think, the follow-up, which is a wave of people starting to, to interpret it, starting to say, okay, now we capped, we get the vision, we see where it's heading, we're going to apply some real-world thinking to that, and then the technologists are going to have a second surge in terms of then delivering on the vision and the use cases that the entrepreneurs identify. Mm -hmm. I mean, crikey, you know, uh, I'm a harmonica player, Imogen's a singer, and yet here we are leading a charge within the music industry to, to see quite where this technology can take us. Yeah, making the blockchain bad. I like that. Well, well let's, let's keep going here, because uh, there, there are a few. Why don't we just get a batch of questions? So, a gentleman in the back, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, and then we'll go here, and then next to you, and then there's, there was one right here as well. Okay, we'll get, we'll get to you. But Alex, so, we'll uh, those three. Um, yeah. thanks very much. Martin Woods from Thomson Reuters. Uh, Michael, you're in the health business, and um, our health data is very, very sensitive, very, very important. I'm in a financial services business. I'm primarily in customer information. I'm in a KYC business. And I'm not a groupie, but I did see you last week, right? And we, you referenced <laughs> KYC last week. 
Um, sure you're but not. But KYC, <laughs> right, KYC is about consent. And we, we have this myth that, you know, it's difficult to find out who's a beneficial owner of a company. You guys have companies as a piece of paper that protects your interest in that company that stops your partners stealing it from you. We, we put a myth in that space. My problem and my challenge with, with it is this, is I'm up for the openness. But I envisage a time in 20 years' time when our children will have their own children. And our DNA is one in two billion. Our blockchain will be one in 10 trillion. Right? And you'll be born. I'm, I'm envisaging this time you're born with a blockchain that kind of defines you. And I'm okay with parts of that because if you take airport security, you know, we need to improve that. We need to start putting these boundaries further out. And there may be temporary blockchains that take you into an airport environment and we can protect people okay. using that with security. Yeah. But where does all the privacy and secrecy go? Does blockchain, and I know you talk in the book about you let out what you want to let out, but when people aggregate that, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I just have that so concern. Pri privacy and security. Against, yeah, against, and pri yeah. privacy against security. With all these systems running and the data that's out there, how do you secure it? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, right here, let's, let's just ask them all. Hi, so um, I think today we've seen how blockchain can help support industries that already exist, but as a 19-year-old, I'm really concerned about the future. So I was wondering how you could elaborate how blockchain will fuel innovation, how it will allow startup companies, firms, artists to develop and get themselves out there. Great question. And then up front here, what was the question? You, sir. Yeah. I'm from Enlivening Edge. It's a magazine of next stage organizations. Mm -hmm. And I'm very curious of whether blockchain will, when it can help, uh, scaling uh, self-management in real-life organizations. By real-life, I mean non-DAO, non just uh, traditional non organizations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so everything but the DAO. Yeah. Uh, OK, great. So um, data privacy and security, um, how does this enable entrepreneurship to flourish? And then what does it mean for everyday firms? Um, specifically, what was the, sorry, what was the last part? Scaling self-management. Self-management? So, okay, for individuals, empowering individuals? For organizations, running organizations without bosses. Okay, who wants to go for it? I want to do, I want to do the innovation and the new stuff. Yeah. Um, if I can take that question. Uh, you know, I think um, it's the most exciting opportunity, particularly for artists. Art, artists in the music industry are the, the drivers of growth. We're the true entrepreneurs in the sector. Uh, and at the moment, we're cut off from one of the most fundamental building blocks of any business, and that's cash. We cannot get access to cash on anything like realistic terms. There's an overblown myth in the music industry about how risky it is, because that perpetuates this kind of incredibly small pool of capital. Yeah? It's so high risk that only we invest, and aren't we special for doing so? Well, no, that's not necessarily true, because we see lots of venture capitalists investing in technology firms, you know, highly scalable businesses that could be built from a laptop in a bedroom and taken global. Well, crikey, there's a lot of artists that sound like that. So if we can use blockchain, use transparency to shed the myth of risk, to show where that ROI is going to come, and to start to attract some of that exciting global capital direct to the entrepreneurs actually creating value, they're in for a better return. Artists are in to businesses that can be capitalized, and there you've got a huge recipe for growth. And just one very specific example I'd give is the idea of incubators. In the tech sector, we've seen incubators really, really uh, foster innovation and growth and new ideas and collaboration between technologists and marketers from around the world. Now, those, those incubators really work because you can take a percent on the way through, and you can say, look, we've hothoused you, we've brought you together, we've given you all these tools and skills, and it's fantastic. And we're going to take a tiny override on what happens next, and who knows, maybe it's worth something. You can't really do that in the music industry because of this arcane architecture and these kind of fusty contracts and the six years for money to come back. All this stuff's impossible. Well, if you resolved a lot of these issues through the blockchain and you just kind of said, well, hey, hang on, incubators work, so we can get artists together in really incredible, exciting collaborations with different creative people, whether they're from the world of music, art, visual arts, entrepreneurship, it doesn't matter where they're from, and these collaborations can occur, they can be hothoused, and value can be tracked and captured effectively. That's great, and in the book also, there's an entire chapter we have on new business models, um, which is basically you know, what kind of new ways of organizing capability and creating value are made possible by that, and I think that's a fantastic example of it. Um, answer, answers to some of the other questions. 
I'll tackle the KYC data issue. I kind of see that as structural risk. Let me explain why. Um, there's sort of hubris in the tech industry today that if you collect an enormous amount of personal information about people, you'll eventually be able to monetize it. That's been proven by a couple firms that have, uh, have a huge amount of value now. But the trouble with this is as you collect more and more data somewhere, you create a digital honeypot and you increase the likelihood that that service or system will be breached. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, the fast, for the past few years, the number of, um, and the rate of online e-commerce fraud has eclipsed the rate of online e-commerce growth. And so you, you talked about this briefly, but we saw the JP Morgan hack, we've seen Target, we've seen um, the US government, uh, you've seen Sony lose absolutely everything. And by the way, this story is going to get worse. It's going to happen with more and more regularity and more and more frequency. And so we kind of need to revisit the risk models. I don't think storing a whole ton of data anywhere is a wise thing. Just like a squirrel doesn't put all of its nuts in one hole to prepare for Christmas, we <laughs> scatter them around. Um, we need to do the same thing with data. And uh, I think that that will be the model that eventually gets approached, and that's already how the blockchain is designed for dealing with people's personal private keys for digital value transactions. But I think the same thing is true for personal records and personal information. If I want to credential into my house and unlock the door, if I want to sell a stock, if I want to share information about my health with my doctor or my, uh, my psychiatrist, there are certain people that need to know that information. My credit card company doesn't need to know that stuff. And so I should have the right to choose, and I should be able to do that on a system where there's a way more federated data model than we have now. And I think that that will be the way it goes. I unfortunately think it's going to be very expensive for consumers. There are going to be a lot of pain in this before we get there. So the last question was on enterprise. That's perfect, David, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, I, so I think the question was, you know, an existing firm and removing management, and I'm not sure we can, you know, necessarily predict that that would happen, but. Um, I think if you look at the promise behind the smart contracts, that these can automate contractual um, uh, conditions uh, of, uh, that, are, that are related to the transactions that are happening on the blockchain, then what you can do is really innovate and you can um, simplify processes within businesses. So, you know, there might be existing processes that happen that are very slow and archaic today. They might require people telephone, they might have specific roles and responsibilities and if you can take that 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 business concept and 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 codify it onto a smart contract and have that run in an autonomous way um, maybe it's reacting to certain external events that are being you know triggering those those smart contracts to run then you can you can really innovate and simplify things within the business and that might mean some fewer managers maybe those managers are redirected to do other jobs and in to do other things within that firm um, but I think that's really, you know, the, the, the key point is around the smart contracts and, and having those, you know, um, sort of execute the transactions on the blockchain. Excellent. So we, we're done for questions. I want to leave some time um, because we've got great closing remarks. Um, but first, I think a round of applause for our panelists here. So it's my pleasure now to introduce um, Simon Taylor. Simon was one of the first people we actually interviewed for the book um, shortly after he had launched single-handedly the blockchain practice at Barclays Bank. And uh, at a time when that was not a popular thing to do, um, has since become the hottest job on Wall Street. Um, but Simon is someone who's uh, not only an expert in blockchain and its application to financial services, but also a leading voice in the banking industry and the fintech industry in London specifically on this issue. And so we're delighted to have him provide some closing remarks. So go ahead. Thank you, Alex, and thank you for, for having me. Uh, you guys in a great panel. Um, so yeah, on the 24th of June, um, something quite momentous happened. I left Barclays, but it kind of got overshadowed, <laughs> as you may have noticed. Um, I was quite annoyed about that. I thought you know most people would be paying attention to the Stegsit, not the Brexit, but um, there that one goes. So at Barclays, I was quite proud of what we'd done. Um, somebody called me Indiana Jones, doing a lot of stuff and getting out just in time. But um, I, <laughs> I, I don't wear a hat, though, um, so I <laughs> feel like I'm missing out. Um, at Barclays, um, over my two years there, I led uh, R&D for blockchain. It started as a side of desk piece, you know, just going to play around with this technology. And then one day, my CTO finds out I know guys like Nick Carey, and I'm being interviewed for books like, uh, like the Tapscots book and says, well, this should be your full-time job, so go figure this space out. Oh, okay, and that was over a steak, and there was a lot of red wine involved, so I, 
I kept him to it, and, um, and I've had a great time since. And in that time, uh, we were the first bank to offer bank accounts to Bitcoin companies. So Barclays now offers accounts to Bitcoin companies and has stopped shutting accounts just because you have a blockchain somewhere in your proposal for a business, which I think is progress from a large organization. But also during that time, I was um, very kindly asked by the UK government to help co-author something called the Government Office for Science Blackkit Review into Distributed Ledger Technology. They, they like short titles. Um, but I would encourage you to check this out. Um, when you talk about you know, changing governments and changing the business of government, I talked to a very senior civil servant who said, the opportunity to change the relationship between the individual and government, to make the business of government more accountable to the citizen, is something that the civil service is very excited by. And that blew me away. What, uh, that's really what they want? Yes, absolutely. They're, they're trying to deliver that now with blockchain technology. And I'd encourage you to look at that report because the civil service did an amazing job on the exact summary of that report. So the London scene, what's happening post-Brexit, um, especially in the blockchain space? Well, I was very fortunate to meet people early on and uh, in the blockchain space. And this is how the CTO discovered I knew these people was because I was out there. And funny story, um, I uh, broke up with a girlfriend in um, January of 2014, just after Christmas, great time to do it. Um, and I had two choices. I could either draw the curtains and drink Jack Daniels, which seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, but I thought instead I'd go and get a hobby, and my hobby was blockchain. And what we figured out was that actually there's an amazing London scene out there. There are innovators, there is a network and a vibrancy. And I wouldn't bet against that network and vibrancy. There is a developer community here that really gets the blockchain space. But also, as, as Nick, who invented a technology called Thunder and then stole my Thunder, said, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I, I'm only teasing. I'm teasing. I genuinely am. Uh, we have a capital of government. We have a capital of finance. We have a capital of technology in the same city. And we have five of the world's top universities within 100 miles. Don't count against that. Yes, we're against a tough time. But actually, Mark Carney, fellow Canadian of yours, um, countryman, is doing some amazing things. And again, that speech is an unbelievable thing. And having talked to Rob Elsie, the CIO of uh, the Bank of England, serious about doing this blockchain stuff. They, they really want to be in that position to do it. And maybe now they've not got the ECB breathing down the neck. Maybe it'll happen a little bit faster. So who knows? Maybe this is a time for rebirth. I think it's going to be an opportunity for us to really start to think about what could we do differently. Yes, the next six months are going to be very challenging, but the things that made London strong are still here. Um, let me just give you one example um, from the financial services sector, and, and I'll uh, throw the mic down. Mic drop, no one. At Barclays, we deal with large financial contracts like the ISDA. This is a very unsexy contract that some of you, I've seen some nodding. The um, International Swaps and Derivatives Association, 92-page contract that tells you everything you need to know about um, over-the-counter derivatives dealing and securities. Fantastic. Well, it takes, on average, according to ISDA, about 90 hours from the agreement of that contract for all of the back-end processing. All of the just turning the handles, making phone calls, pushing, feeding paper into a machine, all the 90 hours. We demoed that on a blockchain, and then we piloted it on a blockchain, and we proved you can get that to three minutes. And we had is to say, yep, that works for us. We, we were excited to work with it. So that's what it means for all businesses. But what really excites me is what does it mean? Who's going to build the Netflix of blockchain? Who's going to build the Facebook of blockchain? Who's going to build the companies we haven't thought of yet? And could they be from London? I really hope so. I think the developer community's here. Um, and I recognize I'm standing between you and free alcohol, so I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs> so we had, we had some um, great insights from some brilliant people across a wide range of industries. I'd like to just say again, thank you, Simon, Imogen, Paul, uh, Michael, David, and Nick uh, for generously being here today. It's been wonderful. So thanks again. Thanks.